What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, sponsored by peer-run support communities Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to our new broadcast station, KBOO, in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Jonathan Metzel. Jonathan is an MD psychiatrist. He's the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan. He's the author of the previous book, Prozac on the Couch, and his new book is called The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. And we're going to be talking about schizophrenia as a diagnosis, racism, and black politics, especially black political protest in the 60s and 70s. So welcome to Madness Radio, Jonathan Metzel. Hi, it's really a, a great pleasure for me to be here. Jonathan, your book is is really an amazing accomplishment of research. It's also a very exciting read. I really strongly recommend people take a look at the protest psychosis. You have unearthed a documentary history of a hospital in uh, Michigan, which really shows the evolution of schizophrenia from a disease that's focused primarily on white women to a disease that was focused on black men, especially associated with hostility and aggression. That's an incredible story that intersects the politics of the 60s. How did you get interested in this? What I did after finishing my residency was uh, I went back and got a, a, a PhD actually in American Studies at the University of Michigan and really looked specifically at the kind of cultural understandings of psychiatric illness in relation to questions of gender and race. Uh, and to me, those were the kind of important kind of nexus points between psychiatry and society. My first book looks at representations of basically white middle class women in in understandings of depression. So it's really a history of pharmaceutical advertising, uh, advertisements and kind of a cultural history of Prozac. And what was interesting about that project was as I was kind of telling the story, I again looked at, you know, years and years of drug ads and memoirs and things like that. And this kind of depression and anxiety medications were constructed in culture as representations of kind of white middle class mothers, little helpers. But it was amazing to me the kind of invisibility of people of color in those representations. So this is a consistent aspect of the history of psychiatry is that instead of being as kind of objective science that looks at medical issues and biological issues, that the cultural context of racism, for example, of sexism, really shapes our understanding of who is mentally mentally ill and what mental illness is all about. Now, in terms of, of race, that goes back all the way back to the uh, slavery days. Right. There was a term uh, in, in the kind of 1860s, a, a series of terms, a series of diagnoses um, that were coined by an American surgeon, Samuel Cartwright. Uh, and those terms, the first one that's kind of the most famous is called dropidomania. And another term that Cartwright uh, coined was called dysesthesia aethiopis. And these were diagnoses of basically black slaves who were in slavery systems and ran away, ran away from their masters. Uh, and what he said was basically blacks are physiologically um, better off in slavery situations and they must be insane if they're running away from their masters. So the disease that was being coined really was freedom in a, in a lot of ways, um, and uh, really kind of problematic assumptions, not only about what that meant, but what the treatments for were for that. So he advocated whipping and other kinds of other kinds of treatment. So there were these clearly racist uses. It, again, this wasn't really coming from psychiatry as much as from surgery, but it was pick, picked up by psychiatric authors uh, over the course of the next 30 or 40 years. So there is a history of basically diagnosing black bodies as being insane for reasons that have, you know, largely to do with with political or social factors, you know, going back at, at least 150 years. So whipping was actually considered a medical treatment for the psychiatric illness of, of, of escaping as a slave. Wanting freedom was considered a mental illness. It's hard to look back on that and think that anything other than just kind of reproducing the social structure of slavery w was happening. But this idea was given a fair amount of credence in, in medical literature at the time. So it seems very extreme to consider s slavery and wanting to escape as a, as a slave, as a mental illness. That's just a clear reproduction of the status quo and a bias 
in the favor in favor of the slavery system. But what's interesting about your book is that you talk about how this similar kind of bias in the favor of the racial status quo persists in psychiatry and continues up through the modern the modern era. Right, you know, it, it really is the central conundrum that I that I try to address in the book, which is on one hand, we've become very aware of problems like not just you know, Cartwright, but also things like Tuskegee and other uh, other examples where the Tuskegee re- experiment, where where blacks were given uh, who had syphilis were not given treatment as part of an ex- research Correct. experiment, and many people died. And it was a terrible medical abuse of ethics based in in racism and not considering blacks as as fully human or deserving ethical protections as whites. Correct. And so and so you know what I say is on one hand we've we, we've ostensibly learned so much from from these lessons and there is a, a strong narrative of you know we're not going to reproduce the problems of the past and at the same time there are you know not quite as obvious to us right now but present day examples where race still impacts diagnosis and the one I talk about in the book actually has to do or, uh, among many uh, has to do with this racially disproportionate uh, diagnostic rates of schizophrenia that African American men are anywhere from four or five six seven times more more likely to be uh, overdiagnosed with schizophrenia compared to other groups. Instead of giving people a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or something less severe, they're getting a schizophrenia diagnosis. The interesting thing about that literature is actually the diagnosis is not just coming from from white men. What's interesting about the the misdiagnosis literature is that they've done studies looking at clinician, you know, clinicians of color, for example, and and African American psychiatrists are just as likely to overdiagnose black men with with schizophrenia. And so, in a way, the the question is very complicated. What what's going on there? And what I try to argue in the book is. It's it's a lot easier for us to say here's a clear case of individual of individual bias. But what I try to show is that even though we've learned many lessons from the past, there are still these kind of structural places where it's not so much individual racism, but structural attitudes about race that impact doctor patient interaction. And one of the things that's interesting about the origins of diagnosis is that you look at the very early um, statistical manual, it was called, I think, the Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Diagnoses, and it's it's very interesting to look at that because the moral and criminal elements are all mixed in with the medical um, aspects, and so you really get this kind of moral and political judgment that's built into the diagno- diagnostic process from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, what, what's so interesting about the diagnostic codes, and, you know, uh, among the stories I trace, trace in the book. I mean, the the main story I tell in the book is about black power protesters from Detroit who were swept up in the system after protesting and ended up in psychiatric hospitals. And so the main story is about how black protesters ended up diagnosed with schizophrenia and the kind of complex ways in which political protest in the 60s was coded as mental illness in a, in a particular way. Um, and a big part of that story are the changes in psychiatric diagnostic codes. And so it's it, it's a very important part of my analysis to look at the ways in which um, issues of protest and criminality and hostility became increasingly described in not just racialized terms, but gendered terms over the course of successive uh, versions of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So tell us, tell us originally before the black protest era of civil rights and black power, how was schizophrenia understood both on a popular level and as a diagnosis? It was primarily a diagnosis that was applied to white women. Is that right? Well, it, schizophrenia had a pretty interesting history. You think of schizophrenia as being this term that's, you know, been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years, but actually the term was coined in 1911 by a Swiss psychiatrist and only came to the United States in about 1915 or 1920. So it's only been with us uh, for uh, about 100 years. And what, what I show in the book is that when the term schizophrenia first hit uh, the United States and, the, you know, early 1920s about. Um, schizophrenia literally means split mind, and it was picked up by psychoanalytic authors who were very concerned with an issue of split mind, but they were concerned with the conscious-unconscious binary of neurosis. And so what they often did was use schizophrenia to talk about things like 
split personality or or neurosis, and it was very often applied to white middle class women, housewives, uh, in in psychiatric literature. Uh, and this played out first in, in professional literature all the way through to the first version of the DSM, which came out in 1952. And that text describes schizophrenia really as a, a relatively mild personality condition that led to kind of splitting of the personality. And you would see that also in, in popular culture. So women's magazines talked about the schizophrenia of being a housewife. There was a, a famous 1948 Olivia de Havilland movie, um, the, the Snake Pit, that talked about a, a white woman who en ended up getting married and three days into her marriage, developed schizophrenia, which was manifest by her inability to recognize her husband. Um, different kind of uh, magazines and newspapers and films that all, all kind of assumed that schizophrenia was this illness of white, uh, often feminine docility, or also white male, white male genius. And one of the main uh, symptoms of it was losing interest in being a wife and a mother and losing interest in doing housework. Right, and even in the in the medical charts I looked at, some of the women, you know, one one of the women created a public disturbance and embarrassed her husband. I mean, it was it just got to be, I mean, rather rather ludicrous. Even though, of course, these were real people's lives that were being affected, and no less painfully than anyone else. So, in a sense, if you are diagnosing if you are diagnosing women who aren't conforming to gender expectations, who aren't being good housewives, who aren't um, being respectful of their husbands, who lose interest in their family, if you're diagnosing them as having a medical condition and then locking them up and putting them in hospitals, basically you're, you're punishing people who are failing to conform to a political structure, a structure of gender dominance in society, and then psychiatry becomes, in effect, a form of social control to keep the status quo in line around gender. Certainly. I mean, what, what's interesting for me about that is that at the time, people thought that they were performing state-of-the-art science. And I, I think in many ways, we're trying to help patients. So I mean, we look back historically, and it becomes very apparent what was happening. You look at the diagnostic rates. I mean, during the mother, Mother's Little Helper era, you know, we know that 70 to 75 percent of Valium prescriptions were, were written to, to middle class women. So, but at the time, it seemed totally logical. And, and so the question that we ask historically is not so much, um, you know, what were those idiots thinking? It's more like, how how could that have seemed so commonsensical at the time? Why was that the dominant paradigm, and why did people why did people believe it? And it's a harder question than it seems because, um, as much as I want to say this was total social control, th then the next question is like, who's who's performing the social control? Where where is that coming from? Um, because I think, rightly or wrongly, a lot of the in individual doctors I looked at, even the ones uh, at the hospital, were genuinely trying to help people. Uh, and so there's always, there's always a tension there. I think it's a really important point because we're not talking about, you know, dissecting individual racism or individual sexist bias among a specific clinician. We're talking about how a culture and a structure it ends up embedding values in its institutions, and then those get played out through professional practice, which is a much more difficult and complicated uh, question. And I think what's interesting about your book is that you you trace this incredible transformation of the diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, because originally those housewives that were being diagnosed, they didn't necessarily have hostility, aggression, paranoia, delusions, the kind of things that we think of as associated with schizophrenia today. And there was this transition that took place. Tell us about that and your research that looks at the way in which the civil rights movement and the black power movement really were connected with the redefinition of schizophrenia to something that was much more associated with hostility, paranoia, and aggression. There's a very radical transformation, not just in American society in the 1960s, but also in American medical and popular assumptions about schizophrenia and mental illness. And really, a lot of the sources that I talked about a moment ago is kind of depicting white women with schizophrenia changed almost literally overnight in the 1960s. One important one site where this happens is in psychiatric and medical literature, where all of a sudden you see increasing numbers of case studies of angry, pro protesting black men who are depicted as suffering from 
new forms of schizophrenia manifest by hostility and aggression and violence. And this really starts to pop up about the mid-1960s. And another key piece of information about that is that the second version of the Diagnostic Manual comes out in 1968, a very important year for our country. And the new version of the DSM uses terminology that basically adds in to the criteria for schizophrenia, aggression, hostility, and projection. So it's, and then it, use, it uses text that talks about male subjects. So it says the patient is aggressive and hostile. He blames other people for his problems. So all of a sudden you see this transformation in the way psychiatry defines schizophrenia. And what I show using statistical data in the book is that that change in language had tremendous implications for shifting the ways in which we diagnose schizophrenia. All of a sudden, aggression, hostility, anger became part of the diagnostic codes. And lo and behold, right after that, you see increasing numbers of African-American men becoming diagnosed with the illness. There's one example from your book of a medication ad that really reflects this. Right. So I, I, I show this uh, both in, in medical literature, but also in kind of popular literature. And one of the really shocking findings that I kind of came across was a, an ad for Haldol. Which is a major tranquilizer that's used to s- schizophrenia, yeah. Right. And, and this was an ad from the Archives of General Psychiatry, one of the one or two most important psychiatric journals in the country that appeared in the aftermath of the Detroit riots. And this ad showed an angry, violent, protesting black man in a street shaking his fist at the viewer. And the text says, assaultive and belligerent cooperation begins with Haldol. So that this very literal representation of an angry, protesting black man as being the kind of symbol of this new form of schizophrenia for which Haldol was supposedly the the cure. (laughs) So black protesters are mentally ill and need to be medicated and hospitalized to um, treat them. And also, you know, in in this ad, and I, I invite readers interested in this topic to, t- to take a look at the ad. It's in the first chapter of the book, but it's really also saying that, you know, it's it's collapsing clinical pathology with what was being presented as so- social pathology, basically saying that psychiatry uh, is expanding its domain to treat this, this anxiety. So uh, psychiatrist viewers of this ad were asked to kind of be afraid of this black man in a certain kind of way and then treat him with Haldol. And so that was a real dramatic shift from the origins of schizophrenia as not associated with hostility, aggression, paranoia uh, at all. And suddenly it's being used um, in a very different context against a very different kind of of patient, the angry black protester. And your book really centers on research and on a hospital that is near Detroit. And Detroit was really a center of the black power movement, the Nation of Islam. It was also a big uh, center of labor unrest, the uh, auto workers movement. And there were riots, of course, in Detroit. And so what were some of the things that you saw in that hospital? The hospital was called the Ionia State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. And I really was honored to get access to, to the files of this hospital. And so Part of the book tells this bigger cultural story about these big kind of large cultural shifts in understandings of and really responses to schizophrenia. And I kind of balance that with telling a a local story, a, a local story about this hospital. And I ask, how did this national story impact the lives of particular people who were incarcerated literally at, at this at this particular hospital and so what I trace m- representations of schizophrenia charts of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia um, over the course of the book and in my research I looked with some of my research we looked at about 800 charts randomly selected charts and what we saw was similar to, to what we've been talking about here that in the 30s and 40s and even early 1950s people hospitalized at this um, at, at this hospital who were diagnosed with schizophrenia were not inherently feared. And all of a sudden in the 60s, you see African-American men who are being uh, diagnosed with this illness who are now coming from Detroit. Some had criminal histories. Some had participated in the Detroit riots. Some had changed their name to Islamic names is the term they use or been members of Nation of Islam uh, or Black Power. And these men become the new schizophrenic uh, subjects uh, of the book and uh, of the hospital. Um, And I tell the case 
histories of a couple of these cases in, in depth, in, in quite a bit of depth, and talk about, you know, how was it that these men ended up diagnosed with mental illness and, and in this hospital? Uh, was it because they were suffering from mental symptoms? Or was it because they were protesting against white society in a way that was coded as mentally ill at the time? You tell the story of one man, Abdul Rashid Karim. Do you want to tell us what, what happened to him in the Ionia Hospital, what his story was? That, that's one of the main uh, stories. This was a, a man who actually started out uh, life uh, living in the Brewster Douglas Housing Project of Detroit. Um, he came from a, a military family. He had gotten in some in trouble as, as a youth. Um, his name was not... Uh, Mr. Kareem at that time, he went to Vietnam to, to fight. Uh, he was on a furlough leave, came back uh, to Detroit to visit his family, got in a fight with some white strangers uh, as he was walking to his house, was swept up by a kind of police raid at the time, um, and gets um, quite extensively uh, abused while in prison to the point where he start, starts to develop mental symptoms. He starts to hallucinate and becomes delusional, and they ship him to the Ionia Hospital. But while he was in prison, he actually had a prison conversion to the to the uh, black Muslims. Um, and so he becomes an active protester, and he's, he's definitely angry and hostile and changes his name. And so then they ship him to this hospital, and, and the, the doctors are working in the hospital, and they bring this guy up in a in a in a um an ambulance and he gets out of the car and he's he's angry and he's hostile and he's projecting and he's everything that de that their manual tells them is the representation of, of of schizophrenia he's talking about the system and he's against the war and he's attacking the, the white um, racist power structure and he's a very politi very political person who's calling for social and structural change who's been sent to Vietnam and then comes back and is beaten by the the police and ends up in prison and so he's got a lot of really good reasons to be angry it's not just a mental illness absolutely absolutely so it's it's you know an ethical dilemma for the doctors of that time, which is, here's a guy who they're meeting for the first time, and he has every one of the criteria for what their profession tells them is the illness. And so what, what do they do? Do they say, no, this is a social construction, and refuse to help him? Do they, do they diagnose him and see if they can treat him? And, and so, in a way, this is where the issue is, like, what's the problem? Is the problem the doctor? Is the problem the system? Is the problem the diagnostic manual? Is the problem the patient? And so I try to tell the story from all the angles and say how actually all these things together conspired to make it seem as if this person had, had schizophrenia. Now, this is a very tragic case, like many of them are. Were there any doctors who, when he was transferred from the prison to the hospital, were there any doctors or nurses who were saying, hey, wait a second here, uh, maybe he's got good reasons to be angry, and maybe he's not just crazy. Maybe this is not an example of a mental illness. Maybe this is someone who just has strong political beliefs and an experience of oppression and racism and who is really channeling them outward in, against the, the system in which they, they live. Were, was there any kind of debate or question about that, or was it pretty much a... Well, we we like to think about this as like the doctor being the you know, the person who's just going by the rules, but there was great debate in the in the professional literature at the time and in the hospital also. I've done oral history interviews with a lot of people who worked at the hospital, and I reproduced some of those in the book, and there was a tremendous amount of debate about were they doing the right thing or not, but it just, you know, I think one thing I was in, you know, could understand in talking to those people was what were their options at the time? These were people who they couldn't really let them go because they were already under court order hold. The system trumps the individual very often in time in cases like this. And that's not an excuse. I don't think like I was just following orders is an excuse. But I will say that in order to change this process, we need to become aware of the structure in, in addition to the problems of the individual. So what was it that happened to Abdul Rashid Karim? Well, it was uh, like many of the stories I talk about, a very tragic story. You know, the, the, the court order was he is in this hospital until restored to sanity. His, his relatives tried again and again to get him uh, released. I, I reproduced a series of really heartbreaking letters between family members and doctors who are talking about, you know, can we get him released? And he ends up, like many of these people, kind of being lost to follow up, which means assume, I assume that he was transferred out to another facility, or very often people died in the, in the hospital. So n not a happy ending at all. So his friends and family were trying to get him out of the hospital. They were sending repeated letters saying he's not ill, he's not crazy, he can come back and live in the community. 
and he was just kept against his will. Right. And his story is, is one example of what happened to many black men in that hospital, not just in um, Ionia Hospital, but in hospitals around the country. Well, the really interesting thing about Ionia, which ties into a lot of national conversations, is that Ionia, over the course of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as increasing numbers of African-American men were brought to the hospital, became, of course, an increasingly black facility. Uh, it went from roughly being 15% African-American in the 40s to being roughly about 70% African-American in the 70s. And as this, wow. process took, as this process took place, people in the community became increasingly concerned about the possibility that people might run away or what might they do in the community. And by the end of the story, um, the hospital in 1977 literally becomes a prison. So the mental health system at this hospital is taken over by the correction system. And pretty much overnight in 1977, the Ionia State Hospital becomes what's called the Riverside Correctional Facility, a medium security uh, prison. And what I found was that even though this was supposedly the era of deinstitutionalization, a lot of the a lot of the black men that I that I studied um, were not deinstitutionalized. They were not let go on the streets. Instead, they were either recast as prisoners almost overnight, or some were farmed out to other prisons and then ended up coming back to, to Riverside a couple of months later. And so there really is. It's hard not to just think of, you know, Foucault's worst nightmare about one system just taking over from the other, and the and the goal here is is social control. But yeah, it really as this happens, hospitals become prison literally overnight. So there's a merging of the criminal justice and the mental health establishment in this diagnosis of protesters, of people who are not conforming to social roles and social values as, as mentally ill, and you end up having a social control mechanism in place in the, in the form of medicine. Right. One of the things that was shocking in your book was reading about how Malcolm X, the black nationalist leader, was seen as paranoid schizophrenic and considered I insane for his views. Definitely as schizophrenia became a, an illness that was increasingly associated with kind of angry black male protest, you see national examples of FBI profilers or leading psychiatrists or other, other people diagnosing leaders of black protest groups as suffering from schizophrenia. And two rather notorious cases, one was that FBI, uh, the FBI had a file on Malcolm X uh, in the late 1950s where the profiler actually diagnosed him with schizophrenia uh, based on his family and his propensity to violence and other, other kinds of things. And so Malcolm X was one example. Another was a NAACP leader, uh, Robert Williams, who was the author of the really great book, Negroes with Guns, and he was advocating basically um, armed, nonviolent resistance uh, in the South. And when the FBI started to go after him, they, they produced these posters that were basically angry, black, schizophrenic man, armed and dangerous on the loose, and plastered these posters all, all over the South. So there was this very direct kind of diagnosing of leaders of these protest groups uh, as being schizophrenic in a way that seemed to kind of collapse schizophrenia and violence as a way of in, kind of highlighting what they thought were the kind of violent tendencies of, of these men. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and our guest today is Jonathan Metzl. Jonathan is an MD psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry and women's studies at the University of Michigan. He's the author of Prozac on the Couch and the new book, The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. And we are speaking today about schizophrenia, racism, and black politics. So that's one part of the story. But then the other part of the story I tell in the book is that this is not just a top-down story. So the rhetoric of schizophrenia and the associations between schizophrenia and violence were also themes that played out in, in black power discourse itself. So it wasn't just psychiatrists who were making this association. It was also people like Malcolm X and, and Rat Brown and Stokely Carmichael and even Martin Luther King who were talking about, about race and schizophrenia and violence in really important ways. And so from that direction, it's a different argument that says, yes, the system and its oppression does drive people crazy. Right. I mean, it's really, to me, it was one of the, they're all important, but it was one of the more important chapters of the book was looking at the ways in which people from within 
civil rights and, and black power were talking about schizophrenia. And, and so I reproduced, I think, 10 or 11 Martin Luther King sermons where he talks about schizophrenia. I talk about Stokely Carmichael, who talks about schizophrenia, other other leaders of, uh, of black protest groups. And in a way, there's a real debate there about is this an illness of dopamine or of the mind, or is this something that's being caused by society or civilization uh, is this the result of racism and really there's no clear answer except to say that this was something very much in the air but it, it impacted the ways that people thought schizophrenia should be treated and so for example for people like Carmichael or two psychiatrists Greer and Cobbs who were writing in San Francisco who wrote the, a famous book Black Rage they were basically saying we don't need to fix dopamine in black people's minds we need to change the system and if we don't do that violence is going to be the only result. So there really was a real debate about who was causing illness and, and what the implications of it were. So there would be a disagreement about whether protest is a symptom or a cure, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. And it had to do with kind of where you locate the problem. Because at this point in the 60s, schizophrenia, there was a, a real popular discussion and debate. There was a lot of different books. There was an incredible interest in psychology that was emerging. There was the work of R.D. Lang, for example, and mm-hmm. the beginnings of the psychiatric survivor movement. And so the whole society is kind of grappling with what does it mean to be normal? What does it mean to be crazy? The society is erupting into conflict, and there are all these social problems that are being addressed, protest movements. There's a war in Vietnam. And so there really was a huge social discussion about madness, sanity, and what the nature of the current crisis was for both the individual and for society. Right. No, I mean, a lot of things are happening around this issue in the 1960s. Uh, you know, I, I write about it a great deal because it's not like you can take this kind of black power stuff about schizophrenia in, in a vacuum. It's happening also in the context of great debate and great critique about, about psychiatry that's coming, as you say, from people like, you know, Cooper and Lang and Zaz and other uh, leaders of the anti-psychiatry movement. Uh, also, deinstitutionalization is working its ra- way through the kind of court system in the United States. So there is a very real debate about is mental illness real or is it a form of social control? And on one hand, I'm pretty critical of that literature because definitely in showing um, that this was a form of social control, it, you know, this argument was then very seamlessly taken up by people who didn't have the best interest. You know, it was taken up by people like Ronald Reagan in California, who was governor at the time, who said, yeah, everything's fake and let's just let all these guys go. And it was a, an excuse to not take care of people. So I think in part, part of what was happening was what was the impact for real people's lives about some of these arguments. But the other, the other point that I, I talk about a lot is that, which was a surprise to me, there were points of actual overlap between black power politics and anti-psychiatry politics. So one example is that Stokely Carmichael spoke to a series of kind of famous uh, meetings put on by, by Cooper and Lang in London. That was the uh, Dialectics of Liberation Conference? Correct. And for anybody who wants to see this kind of tension between individual and cultural definitions of schizophrenia, I urge you to read Carmichael's um, really, really brilliant uh, remarks. He He was flying to London. All of his luggage and notes and notebooks and briefcase had been confiscated because he was kind of coded as a terrorist at the time. So he shows up at this conference with pretty much nothing and talks off the top of his head and gives this brilliant conversation to a group of psychiatrists and psychologists. And what he says is, you people are all concerned with individual racism or individual problems, doctor-patient interactions, things like that. But what I want to tell you is, as a black man in America, I don't really care about any of that stuff because what matters to me much more is institutions or structures. So what impacts my life are things like zoning laws and schools and funding and healthcare systems and things like that. Wars. Right, <laughs> right. So he really urged an emphasis on institutional awareness in a way. And so in a way, Carmichael's talk to that conference, I talk about it in the introduction, it became kind of the central, you know, one of the central inspirations for, for my book. I think it's a really, really brilliant um you know, conversation about the kind of overlap between the concerns of psychiatry and, and, and of politics. One of the ideas that's that's happening in the 60s and, and early 70s is, of course, the idea of, of revolution. And this was not just uh, idealistic fantasy. I mean, there were societies that were just turning 
upside down. There was a massive general strike in, in France. There had been extensive riots uh, in many cities in the United States. And so a lot of the argument among activists was, hey, let's not focus on any individual problems here. Let's not look at individual reforms. Let's overturn the whole society. Let's get control of the government and the economy. And then we can really start helping issues like sexism and, and racism and individual problems. And now I think that we've learned that you cannot just separate those two things. You cannot just say everything is structural. We have to focus on structural problems because even if you do have a revolutionary process, you still end up with individual needs and individual uh, dynamics. And so the two things have to kind of go hand in hand rather than being one or the other, I think. Really, really nicely said. I, I completely agree. Yeah. And of course, there were arguments about that in the United States, too. People were arguing for forming one example from around here in Detroit was the Republic of New Africa. So people were trying, you know, the question was, was that going to happen in the United States? And what's so interesting about the 60s is, of course, it was an era where change really was a viable option that, you know, in a way people believed that their protest could possibly change the system. Absolutely. And the government was very, very f worried about that as well. Right. And they were preparing for major civil war and looking at the protest movements in the streets as being the beginnings of a revolutionary uprising in the country. So it was it was very much a, a possibility that was being considered as, as real. And it also parallels this discussion about whether mental illness is real or not, is the, the Zaz's book, The Myth of Mental Illness. And I think that, again, is it becomes a false dichotomy because when we are saying, for example, that um, men, black men who are very angry and protesting and throwing a punch at, at, a, at a cop or have come back from Vietnam very traumatized and joining the Nation of Islam and being part of a revolutionary movement, we're not saying that those individuals don't also have very deep individual wounds, that they may be suffering, that there may be very serious kind of individual problems that they need help with. I think what you're saying is that to exclude the structural context to stop looking at the social factors here and to only see it as individual does end up becoming a form of social control. Yeah, very, very nicely put. I mean, I get asked very often, you know, because of my book, do I think schizophrenia is real or do I think these people really suffered from schizophrenia? And as much as I can, I try to kind of, it's not so much talk around the real false binary, but I don't I don't think that voting about whether something is real or fake, you know, it's both things. <laughs> it's both things. And so in, in the case here, schizophrenia was on one hand being socially constructed, literally, and at the same time, it had very real implications for people's lives. And so I don't think that by saying something is reflective of social forces or institutional forces, it doesn't make it any less real for the people who have family members or suffer from it or something. What I argue is that we need to pay attention to, as you say, both both factors because social forces can really impact individual expressions of illness. Jonathan, let's talk a little bit about what's happening today because this is not just ancient history. This These are dynamics that are continuing to the present. You, you mentioned that um, black men tend to be much more overdiagnosed as schizophrenic, which is, of course, a very severe and stigmatizing label. And the rates of a diagnosis of schizophrenia for black men is much, much higher. There was a study that was done where identical case information is given to psychiatrists and just the factor of race alone would end up giving someone a more severe diagnosis. So we know that there's a structural racism that's going on. The, also, the, the issue of force, that people of color end up being put in restraints and put into hospitals against their will at a much higher rate than, than whites do, and also over-medicated. And all of that happens at the same time that there's a certain neglect of mental health issues, that people who are depressed or anxious, who are people of color, don't tend to get the kinds of support and help that they need. So it's either an, an overuse of force and diagnosis or an, an under-caring. Right. I mean, I think a lot of times, on one hand, I have so much admiration for people who were brave enough to protest in the 1960s because they were identifying real injustice. And what they did was put themselves at risk in the hope that they could change society. But at the same time, I feel like our jobs today, and I'm sure it's just relative, are much they're incredibly difficult right now because it's like at least in the 60s there was this idea that if you protest you can change the system or you can change the structure and so um 
school teachers protested and garbage workers protested and you know there were protests in the street all the time and the idea was if we work hard enough we, there there is the possibility we can change society for better or worse we can topple the capitalist system and get a different regime in place basically right and and what's happened since that time are these increasing levels of kind of institutionalized learned helplessness and one aspect that i work on of course is in in the area of mental health and Again, the issues are incredibly complicated. So when I went into this book looking at this misdiagnosis literature, I thought, well, of course, it's that these doctors are racist. They're overdiagnosing the black men based on their own stereotyped assumptions. But what I found in doing the research on the book was that, again, it didn't matter who the doctor was. They were just as likely to, I mean, as I said before, black doctors and white doctors misdiagnose at the, at the same rate. There are people within the black kind of activist psychiatry community who argue that overdiagnosis of schizophrenia is reflective of a real phenomenon, which is that black men are being driven crazy by racism. So, of course, they're going to have schizophrenia more than white men. Conversely, in in the realm of kind of biological science, we argue that culture shouldn't matter, that schizophrenia is an illness that should occur in all people equally because of deep biological structures, and so race shouldn't be a factor at all. And so you get all these kind of conflicting and competing messages, and what I try to do at, in the end of the book is kind of parse out that stuff and say, well, what what is it? What kind of things should we and can we protest against, and what, what should be the implications of that? One example is in, in medical education, for example, where, you know, medical the medical system is pretty aware of these racial disparities in diagnosis. And the, the ways that it's dealt with it uh, up until now is to implement something that's called cultural competency training. Um, what they say is basically that we need to train doctors to be more culturally aware or culturally sensitive to the kind of race, racial or ethnic backgrounds of patients. Because if doctors are more aware of that, they'll be less likely to put them in in the wrong category or, or something. And so there were, there's been a move over the past, you know, 10 or 15 years to train doctors about the cultural backgrounds of patients. Now, on one hand, that's a really good thing, right? Because before we were just ignoring the aspect of kind of a person's background led to all these problems. And at the same time, what, what we've seen is that that kind of training doesn't impact the issues that I'm talking about here about race and diagnosis. The rates remain the same, basically. The rates, the rates pr pretty much remain the same. Um, and what I argue in the book is that, in part, I, I support the idea of training people to be individually more sensitive. But at the same time, we're, we're leaving alone the story that I'm trying to tell here, which is actually that the structure itself we assume that the race is the race of the patient or sometimes the race of the doctor, but we overlook the fact that the diagnostic codes have racialized kind of histories or that the, that the treatment system is embedded in a, in a kind of racialized system. And so what I argue in the book is that even though we should probably continue training doctors to be culturally competent, that we should also teach them to be structurally competent and to see how structural factors can can impact these things. So it's always a tension between these these particular issues, I would say. What might uh, training doctors to be structurally competent look like? Because I think one of the dangers of the cultural competency uh, move in psychiatry is that basically pharmaceutical companies are saying, wow, we are missing out on the African-American and Latino and Asian markets. We want to get our medications into those communities. We want to overcome stigma, which is often actually in practice an obstacle to marketing. We want to lower stigma so that people feel more comfortable buying our products, getting on medications, getting a diagnosis. It just becomes part of the pharmaceutical marketing imperative. I argued that psychiatry needs to become more engaged with the larger political issues about the mental health disparities, about pharmaceutical issues, and in much more progressive ways than it has in, uh, up to this point. One of the discussions that we often have on Madness Radio is the usefulness of diagnostic categories themselves, that perhaps we should have a mental health system that's really based on providing care and therapy and support and resources for people based on their experience as they define it for themselves, rather than feeling like someone has to immediately be put into a box and given a label that essentially stays with them for life. It's not like a criminal record. It can't be erased by a judge, deeply, deeply stigmatizing. And then, of course, runs the risk of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy that someone defines themselves as, oh, I'm bipolar, therefore 
this is my identity and that explains my experience rather than focusing on the complexity and the uniqueness, the individuality of people's experience with something like extreme mood swings or dealing with voices or very deep depressions or difficulty communicating that we focus on human problems rather than putting people into medical categories. And, well, the other part is, of course, that a diagnosis has certain I don't want to say like benefits, like we traditionally think of benefits, but a diagnosis puts you in a category that says we know what's happening with you and we have a, a plan for how to treat you. It can be very empowering and relieving for many people to finally get that diagnosis. There's a validation that, yes, my suffering is real and, hey, I do need some support. I can't just do this on my own. And there's an explanation that there's a pattern here that things fit together. Right. And, and so if somebody comes into my office and talks about some of the things we've been talking about here, it's, I don't think it's my job to say, you know, sir, you're suffering from a socially constructed illness and we need to change society rather than treat the individual. You know, I think that's <laughs> malpractice and it probably should be. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I think that, as you say, there are these incredibly powerfully stigmatizing individual and structural aspects of of diagnosis and individual ones we, we know about, discrimination, things like that. But on a broader level, if you're talking about politics, for example, it's really important to look at the 60s as a case study where putting something in the category of mental illness also automatically implied that we didn't have to pay attention to the content of that political protest. Exactly. So the minute you put you, the minute you put a black power protester in a Haldol ad, it didn't, you know, who gives a darn what, what he's saying because it's insane. So we don't have to take it seriously. And so in a way there is this incredibly depoliticizing move. Well, when you say when you say improving the structural competency of psychiatry, it makes me think of some of the guests that we've had on Madness Radio talking about mental problems, psychological distress, not as individual problems, but as questions of community development. So yes, you do have individuals that are suffering, and suffering is very real, but the solutions can be community solutions. There is a study that was done by an NYU uh, researcher about, for example, providing micro-lending um, enterprise loans to individuals who are having depression and getting them involved in small businesses and getting them involved in improving their poverty conditions. And the study showed that, that the, these folks who are having very high scores on depression uh, tests uh, who were also poor when you got them into situations where they were feeling economically empowered when their incomes were going up well hello their depression goes down so how can we create community solutions that address the needs of individuals that look at structural problems rather than saying this is a medical issue it's a problem with your brain we're just going to focus on medications and become getting you to become a pharmaceutical company consumer and then that's the end of the discussion no, that's really nice. That's really nice. I mean, uh, one other aspect I would add is that we're having a debate now uh, for better and sometimes for worse about the, the new DSM. The DSM-5 uh, mm -hmm. um, is going to be coming out in a couple of years. And on one hand, there's a lot of we, what well, we can call progress. They're probably going to do away with the category of paranoid schizophrenia, which was the one of the more problematic categories in terms of the stuff I've been talking about. Um, and so there is a kind of, you know, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. I'm, I'm pretty concerned about all the psychosis risk syndrome stuff. But the psychosis risk syndrome means basically that you you have very you have either no symptoms or very slight symptoms of uh, psychosis or madness, and then well, now we need to put you on medications in order to prevent things from getting worse. So it's like a huge marketing expansion for pharmaceutical companies. Right. And also, we just don't really have any proof that putting people on antipsychotics has any preventative function. So exactly. it, there are some pretty pretty valid questions here. But the other issue is, will it help to just do away with the category itself? And the last section of my book is called Remnants. I do a bunch of chapters where I talk about how even though we've improved in all these ways, moved on from dropidomania, changed the diagnostic category, become, you know, we took out anger, hostility, projection, and all those things are long gone from the DSM, but we still live with the individual and societal after effects of, of that. In the book, I talk about, uh, on one hand, the criminal justice system as being a remnant of this particular era, where even though we changed all this stuff, the idea of kind of criminalizing mental illness really took off after the 1960s in ways that was largely out of control of, you know, the psychiatric system after that. Um, and the flip side is that I show how 
the character of schizophrenia remains a protest identity in certain aspects of culture. And so I've got a chapter on rap and hip hop artists who call themselves schizophrenic as a way of kind of protesting against against the system. And so to say that psychiatric terms also continue to fo- to function as as protest tropes in, in society in ways that I think are important because it's not just the doctor's definition of mental illness that's at play. Wow, which um, which uh, hip hop artists describe themselves as schizophrenic as a form of protest? I've got about uh, I think 150 examples. <laughs> I've got quite a few. So um, you know, I talk about Tupac and Isham, and uh, and really it's kind of a who's who list of famous hip-hop artists who at one point said yeah i'm schizophrenic the system has made me schizophrenic racism has made me schizophrenic in their lyrics the rappers very often say you know yeah i'm schizophrenic and that means that i'm more dangerous i'm more violent i'm more of a threat to society the police or i'm, I'm fighting back against the system and in a way what i say is that they're using schizophrenic not so much in the psychiatric terminology but they're basically using this term almost exactly the way it was used in, in black power politics in the 60s. And then turning it around as a form of empowerment and resistance in the way that hip-hop music does. Exactly. It's a, it's a protest identity, yeah. Jonathan, we are just about out of time. Let people know how they can get in contact with you and then again mention the name of your book. The name of the book, once again, is The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease, published by Beacon Press. It's widely available. Um, I've also just done a series of interviews uh, through the magazine Psychology Today that gives some reference material. And I'd be delighted if anybody wants to contact me. My email address is jmetzel, J-M-E-T-Z-L, at umich, U-M-I-C-H, dot E-D-U. Jonathan Metzel, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Terrific. Thank you so much. You've been listening to an interview with Jonathan Metzel. He's an MD psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry and women's studies at the University of Michigan. He's the author of the book Prozac on the Couch and the new book, The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall, music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.